welcome to Maine Pod Girl. This is a podcast made by pop heads for pop heads. Every episode, y'all can check in with us while we discuss your burning questions, as well as what's happening in pop music. Throughout this series, we'll be chiming in on our favorite recent discussion threads and chatting with some of our all-time favorite artists and music commentators. What's up? I'm <laughs> an alt pop artist. Sorry. I'm an alt pop artist, songwriter, and Leah Michelle's translator, Sola. And I'm a pop rock <laughs> artist, songwriter, and Charlie Puth's thirst trap consultant, AJ Marks. Oh. Wait, is he is he thirst trapping for you or are you No, he, I'm the consultant. I, I approve the thirst traps before they I go. I see, out. I see. Okay, fantastic. I go, this one doesn't have enough butt in it, you know? Right. Right. But uh, that's <laughs> this one. This one won't entice the gays as much. Charlie needs to know these things. He needs to know what he's getting himself into. It's true. It's true. Anyway, so you might have heard today's guest voice on this podcast before. He's a New York DJ, actor, Twitch streamer, and writer whose credits include Vanity Fair, Medium, BuzzFeed, and The Huffington Post. Time Out New York has named him one of the most stylish New Yorkers, and he hosts the popular pop podcast, Pop Pantheon. That was a lot of peas. I made that just for you. <laughs> Where he slowly ranks every pop pop megastar we know and love in five tiers of stardom let's give him a warm welcome our friend dj louis the 14th Ooh, my voice <laughs> you're gonna need to learn how to read if you're gonna be reading for <laughs> leah michelle <laughs> oh my god i know i've just been reading all day for leah so i you know i'm tired yeah. so <laughs> you're, you're a little worn out <laughs> It's true. I have to issue a slight correction, which is unfortunately, I now live in Los Angeles. So, oh my god, I, oh. I, that, I know. Update that website. <laughs> <laughs> my website is woefully out of date. So I'm glad we had a moment to like highlight that. I was also thinking that because I was like, this is very interesting because in my head, you were Los Angeles, and when we were coordinating times, you were in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Well, I am a lifelong New Yorker. I grew up there and I lived there for like my whole adult life. And I I technically sometimes refer to myself as bi-coastal because I do have a place there. But I I primarily live in Los Angeles now, unfortunately. <laughs> You're a bi-coastal elite. <laughs> I'm a bi-coastal elite, literally. I'm like everything that they love to hate. I'm a podcaster and DJ and bi-coastal. <laughs> oh, Latte my God. sipping. <laughs> F word. Do you ever go on first dates and you're like, yeah, I'm a DJ, and then have people are like, oh god, here we go again. Yes, <laughs> they're like, you're my fourth DJ. <laughs> no, I know, I know, you're like ten years younger than me. It gets so much worse. Like when you're in, when I was in my like early and mid twenties, and I would tell people I was a DJ, it'd be a mix of like. Uh, is that real? And also like, whoa, cool. Like you seem cool. Like that must be cool. And then as you get older and you're like in your mid thirties and you're dating people that are like really looking for stability in their lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, the reactions get like cooler and cooler and more distant. And, and then you throw podcaster in there too. And people are really thrilled. Let me tell you. <laughs> God, that is podcaster is not an attractive one. I no, literally leave me alone. I was like, don't ask questions. Don't don't ask questions. Literally. For all you know, I'm Calvin Harris, okay? It's true. For all that they know, you are Marshmallow without the head. Exactly. Like, yeah. don't make fucking assumptions. So I will tell you, it's it gets worse. Unlike what they try to tell you in those advertisements, it actually gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Enjoy it while it lasts. It gets worse. I learned something when I was researching you before this episode, and it was that you wrote Carly Rae Jepsen and the Rise of the Micro Pop Star. Yes. That article is the reason why I call people micro pop stars. Me too! Whoa, whoa. No, it's crazy. Wow. I think you're the biggest celebrity we've had on this show. That is such a crock of shit, please. Like, get over that. Wait, you don't like it? Wait, I, I, because I've been using that for the past, like, three years. AJ and I have been saying that to each other before this show even started. We were talking about micro pop stars and stuff. Like, it's been in our vernacular for many, many moons. I love that. We've had many a micro pop star. On. Yeah, you guys are like the fucking providence of micro pop stars. I <laughs> I now call them niche legends as my baseball niche hat legends. says oh, yes. because that's that's the tier for the micro pop stars. But yeah, I do that article was like something I had wanted to write for a really long time before I did it because like as you guys will be not surprised by listening to Pop Pantheon, I'm obviously like <laughs> obsessed with this notion of pop stars who are like not that famous, <laughs> you know, 
know who are what? like as a queer man. Just... <laughs> <laughs> ah! Say it so. Okay. Yes. Like I'm not going to deny, but also <laughs> I think it's less about like being fascinated by sort of like standing people because they're underappreciated, which I feel like is the kind of gay man cliche. And more so I'm intrigued by the idea that 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 I laid out in that article, which is this idea of pure pop musicians who like don't need to be megastars, like who can Mm. like operate like indie artists, indie pop stars. Because when I was younger, that didn't exist. And that felt Mm. like a really new thing that developed over the course of the 2010s. And I was just really interested by it. Yeah, the fall of the monoculture. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And like, yeah. And and sort of this embrace of pop as like something that could be credible because I think these artists often operate like indie acts in the sense that they are, like they, they kind of trade on credibility more so than like traditional commercial success, which is not something that when Mm. I was a young pop fan, pop stars had a lot of access to they were mostly sort of seen as frivolous and lacking in substance etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. yeah which i'm so happy is different now like my god me too it is so much better to have this universe of micro pop stars because you know i just think that if you have something to say you deserve to be able to say it and you deserve to be able to find your own audience however big or or small that is as long as you are you know putting your heart and soul into what you do then like power to you and so you know god bless tiktok as much as you're fucked up god bless you and uh instagram etc and you know prior to all of that obviously like blog and blog house culture i think was really one of like the big things that set this whole thing into motion sorry we just did a gale pod so of course <laughs> it's gonna be you know in in the tiktok mindset <laughs> right now anyway so let's start with our little icebreaker what music has everyone been listening to aj i nominate you you go first okay i'm going for shock value here I'm going to say David Guetta and BB Rexa. I'm good. I don't think I've ever heard that song. It's the one that samples Blue, Baba D, Baba Da. Oh, yeah, I did. I heard it one time. <laughs> so for me, obviously, Audrey Nuna. Obviously, because I'm obsessed with her. Obviously. Well, like, obviously for me, <laughs> just because it's me. <laughs> also, I discovered a song that I should have discovered many, 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 many moons ago. And I am so sorry. I don't know how this song went over my head, but Flexin by TK Maitza and Duckworth. Ooh. Ooh. Off of Last Year Was Weird, Volume 1. Ooh. I was expecting you to say, like the biggest hit in the world and be like, how did I not hear this? Teenage dream. How have I not heard it? How have I not heard this until yesterday? (laughs) Yes. What about you, Louis? Here's my thing with new music. I, because the podcast is so all consuming to me all the time, Mm. I'm often like in these incredible deep dives into like artists that we're about to tape episodes on because I listen to every single thing I can get my hands on by an artist that we're recording an episode on. And that can sometimes be like a gargantuan project that takes me a long time. So I'm often stuck in the past these days, but I'll say the really cliche answer because it's really the truth, which is that like when I have a breather to go listen to something new, I'm very still stuck on Renaissance. Like I just am completely consumed by that album in a way that I honestly cannot remember the last time that a new pop album like took over my being in this way like as i've gotten older again i hate to keep saying that but it's true (laughs) as i've gotten older like i find myself for better or worse like less apt to get like truly sucked in and obsessed with an album like i feel like that used to happen to me all the time when i was like in my teens and 20s like it would be like i just move one to the next to the next and it would be like obsession and i could take in a lot these days like even when i listen to something and like it i find it like hard for me to like return like it's been a really interesting experience to have that part of myself reawakened again where i'm like any free second i get like i need to listen to this album it's like completely like consumed my existence love it so today's topic is a really really big one so just so everyone knows we will not be able to probably talk about everyone in as much detail as you want so if you want us to address anyone in any more detail please comment but this episode is all about super producers yeah so super producers how i personally would define them is like someone who has defined like a specific sound or era of pop music or in pop music i should say and has like worked with multiple influential artists on different songs or different albums and those have to be influential as well if that makes sense like it has to be something that 
that's remembered with time, not just a bunch of hits, if that makes sense. And also, this is not always the case, but if their name is widely recognized by pop fans, that also definitely helps. But if they have a large, notably large body of work that's well known by pop fans, I feel like that also kind of counts. Do they have to have a distinctive sound? I think so. That's like recognizable? I think so. I think so. (sighs) Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of producers that are coming to my mind right now that are like prolific and very successful, but like unidentifiable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Like, I think the king of them to me is like Greg Kirsten who is like oh, incredibly talented. I can always tell when it's a Greg Kirsten song. I disagree with you there. Really? I think he's had specific sounds. I'm a Sia fan. I know, but I think, well, I, but like, I feel like his sound is so just sort of like very well-made pop songs as opposed to like something truly like just like Pharrell mm. and the Neptune sound who I know we're going to talk about in the early 2000s, late 90s, whatever, is so immediately identifiable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. And yeah. so is kind of like the Max Martin Martin, early Max Martin, you know, uh, Britney and Sync material, like or Timberland, whatever. Like a lot of the people we're about to talk with, it's like the minute it comes on, you're like, ah, yeah, uh, uh, whereas like. I sometimes feel like Greg Kirsten, Jack Antonoff sometimes. Like, you know, I don't know. Like there's like no, a No, yeah, I think I think a lot of people have very different definitions of what a super producer is because I was actually arguing with one of my producers about how Max Martin counts as a super producer. And he was saying like, no, he doesn't count as a super producer because he doesn't have that much name recognition. Like What? I know. I was like, are you mad? I think he is <laughs> the super producer. Uh, I would agree with you there. Yeah, so Tomas suck it. Anyway. <laughs> literally like the most successful pop producer of all time like without competition yeah but the fact that even someone who's like like this guy knows so much music like the person that i'm talking about who was uh, shading max martin and mm-hmm. it is funny to me that that could even be a perspective mm. <laughs> that that max martin doesn't count i actually think that makes him more of a super producer because i think of him more as this machiavellian private person in the studio mm. as opposed to someone that's actually also trying to convert that into being like a front person which like maybe takes away from the super you know what i mean yeah, like no like pharrell pharrell is like blurry i mean pharrell's obviously still mainly known as a producer but pharrell also had like massive career ambitions as a solo artist that like are you gonna say he was blurring the lines that's, very <laughs> that's what it sounded like yeah. <laughs> no i'm not that sharp yeah <laughs> well on that pun let's dive in to these super producers i was gonna say let's start with pharrell and, and the neptunes and uh timbaland okay So our first super producer we're actually doing as like a sort of group. And this group is made up of Pharrell, the Neptunes, which is obviously half Pharrell, and Timbaland. We're not sure what was in the waters in southeastern Virginia in the 80s and 90s, but my God, did it deliver. This selection of super producers all hail from the same area in Virginia, and two of them are even blood related. So let's dive in. Timbaland. Timbaland is a producer, rapper, singer, songwriter, and record executive. He spent his teens DJing and honing his production skills, working with fellow Virginia native Missy Elliott. In high school, he even formed a production ensemble SBI, aka Surrounded by Idiots, with his cousin, who we will get to in a second. Timbaland's big break into the mainstream was in 1996 for R&B singer Genuine. In the next few years, Timbo's mainstream success continued with Aaliyah album One in a Million and Missy Elliott's album Supa Dupa Fly. These releases made him a prominent young producer for R&B and hip-hop artists, but his legacy was only beginning. Dun, dun, dun. Remember that cousin that I mentioned a little bit earlier? Well, that cousin is none other than Pharrell Williams! Pharrell and his production partner Chad Hugo formed their production duo called The Neptunes in 1990, and their breakthrough also came in 1996 as producers on SWV's song Use Your Heart. Three years later, they would help launch Khalees into stardom by producing her first two records. But it wasn't until 2001 that they really made their mark in the pop music world. Scoring radio hits with No Doubt, Britney Spears, Nelly, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Usher, Justin Timberlake, Jay-Z, and Beyonce. So many names. (laughs) Just between the years of 2001 and 2002 alone, the Neptunes had their names on 123 released songs. Ooh. It's crazy. It's it's insane. They were so prolific. Yeah. It is crazy. Yeah. And oh, and by the way, I'm doing all these bios, if you couldn't tell. So meanwhile, Timbaland was also getting into the pop field, producing his hits for Justin Timberlake, Madonna, and Shakira. In the 
mid 2000s, he signed Nelly Furtado and One Republic to his label Mosley Music Group, proving his grip on the pop scene was just as strong as his influence in hip hop. By 2014, Timbaland had written 85 UK hits and 99 US hits. In 2013, Pharrell experienced a slight career renaissance when he was featured as a solo artist on two of the biggest records of that year, Get Lucky and Blurred Lines. He also had a smash hit of his own the following year with Happy, and this new wave of name recognition led to another string of hits in the latter half of the 2010s, producing hits for Ed Sheeran, Camila Cabello, and Migos, and working on projects for Megan Thee Stallion, Doja Cat, and Ariana Grande. Timbaland has received widespread acclaim for his innovation, distinctive stuttering, rhythmic style and beatboxing entertainment weekly claims that just about every current pop trend can be traced back to him from sultry urban edged r&b songstresses to the art of incorporating avant-garde sounds into number one hits pharrell has been widely referred to as one of the most influential and successful pop music producers of the 21st century having had a significant impact on the sound of modern popular music of the neptunes pharrell often adds his own additional vocals on records and appears in the duo's music videos while chad tends to stay in the back behind the scenes. This trend has carried on to this day with Pharrell being the most public face of the pair, both in terms of artistry as well as his separate production and writing discovery. Get in the back, Chad. Wow. Okay. So that was a big, big, big bio. That will be our biggest bio because there were three things that we had to mention there. (laughs) But there's so much to talk about Mm. with these three different people. Yeah. I would like to start with the fact that we pulled your Pop Pantheon Discord users on which super producer was their favorite. We also pulled Popheads on Twitter and the favor leaned in Timbaland's uh what's what's the word I'm looking for? They liked Timbaland. They liked <laughs> Timbaland more. Yeah. And they all liked Timbaland more than Pharrell. And I just find that insane because I always thought that it was like either slightly more Pharrell or just like completely like it was hard to pick between the two so why do we think that is like in terms of like pop fans specifically having a Timberland preference I think Timberland's peak era production sounds less dated than Pharrell's does and I also think Pharrell had the patina of cheese on him during that early 2010s comeback I think people thought happy was corny and yeah i agree with them yeah that's what i was gonna say wasn't it for like a soundtrack though or like despicable me or something that's part of the reason why it had the patina of cheese which i will use for the rest of my life now the patina (laughs) of cheese (laughs) i that's just a wild guess and i don't mean that to diss pharrell who has an incredible body of work but i just think like pharrell at least for me as a Pharrell fan, has done more to kind of like give me a mm, feeling in recent times. Whereas Timberland just like hasn't really been making prominent hit music really since his like second peak in the yeah. late, mid to late 2000s, it feels like. So we remember him for the songs that we love, whereas like a lot of people didn't even realize that Pharrell was a producer or a part of the Neptunes when he broke as an artist in his own right, simply because a lot of people just don't know about producers. Like we're we're all weirdos and we like looking at song credits or things like that. But, you know, the average pop listener isn't always going to know who's produced what, who's done what on you know x y or z hit and maybe this is just perceptually but i think that part of the whole thing was people were introduced to pharrell or you know a significant portion of the population were introduced to him as the get lucky happy blurred lines guy and then found out oh khalees oh all these other things that i love like sort of after the fact Uh, blurred lines what an introduction I, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like that's sad for people because it's so. I it think so pop, because though. it's like his best work is so clearly still to me that that sort of late '90s mm. and to the early 2000s yeah. period. And I also think to your point you were just making. I think generally speaking, because of internet standum, people are so much more aware of production and songwriting credits now in general yeah. than yeah. they were like when I was a kid. Like yeah. when I was a kid, you really had to dig to find that shit out. Like before you even had Wikipedia and these internet, I mean, you really had to like look you at the like, CD booklet. Yeah, buy the and, CD. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you couldn't like click the name in the booklet and say, yeah. Yeah. here's everything else this person produced. So in the era of internet standing, I think it's become much more of a widespread like 
normal practice to know who produced and wrote songs. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But at the time when like Blurred Lines, Happy, Get Lucky, that was all, you know, early 2010s. Mm -hmm. Spotify had just really become a thing. You know, we were really just starting to get into that sort of era of music, internet, standum, at least outside of Twitter. And what you're saying is like, (laughs) I think Blurred Lines... And Happy are two of the most, like, derided hits of that period. I mean, like, for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Like, Blurred Lines is obviously, like, be turned into, like, a very controversial and unsavory hit. And Happy is something that I think a lot of people find corny. So It's like the opposite. It's just too neutered. (laughs) Yeah, so I think that that, maybe that has, in my, like, just pontification and why the poll shook out that way, that's what I would maybe guess. I would agree with that. That makes sense. So I know that I mentioned Timbaland is known for adding beatboxing and percussive vocal elements to tracks and having these, like, songs based in R&B sort of, for lack of a better word, realness. Um, what do you think makes up the key elements of Pharrell, the Neptunes, and Timbaland in their production? Well, I sort of see them as the premier two producers as part of a larger wave of producers that began kind of in the mid to late 90s that were sort of like mechanizing R&B music. So like, if you mm. think about like the R&B music of just even the earlier part of the decade, You're dealing with a lot of kind of like boom bap driven traditional drum machine, hip hop oriented pop music. Think about Mary J. Blige, for instance, being like a really great example of that. Or even like Jimmy Jam and Terry's work for Janet in the early 90s. Like there's this sort of like still kind of stuck in these sort of production styles of the late 80s and early 90s. The wave that Timberland and Pharrell, I feel like, are at the forefront of, and, you know, the other people I would group in this category are Rodney Jerkins, Jermaine Dupri, um, Shakespeare, Kevin Briggs is his name. He produced a lot of the, like, first few Destiny Child hits and uh, No Scrubs are sort of, like, taking R&B into like a futuristic sort of computerized space that incorporates a lot of like dance music elements, synthesizers, Mm. you know, computerized drum programming. And then from there, I think there's a lot of differences between Pharrell and Timberland, which is that Pharrell's beats were about minimalism Mm. and they're quite skeletal and they're really simple kind of space aged funk is what they often got referred to sort of taking the elements of funk music stripping them down to like the bare bones and recreating them through a computer that is sort of punctuated by these sort of drooping synthesizer noises that you might recognize on Khalees's caught out there for instance like pew, 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 <laughs> those, those kind of or things. even the the whistle on um what's it called <laughs> Oh, the slide whistle. Yeah, right. Drop it like it's hot, yeah. Yeah, like they usually have like skeletal funk beats with like some sort of weird sort of lead, weird sound like that, that like is the kind of defining characteristic of the Neptunes. Whereas Timberland, I feel like is a lot more about kind of like maximalism and thickness. Mm. Like it's a like those beats are very dense, yeah. but they're all about spaciousness and sort of like grouping together of sounds and then sort of like giant gaps of space. So if you think about like Missy Elliott's Hot Boys, for instance, like Or Aaliyah's Are You That Somebody? There's like a kind of collection of stuttering beats in the first half of a measure, like follow or in one measure, followed by kind of like a giant gap of air. They're almost like arrhythmic and sometimes can be like a little bit hard to dance to because of that. Mm. Uh, There, you know, you kind of like want to do dun dun. (laughs) It's it's it's, it's not like a four on the floor vibe. So. You know, and then he's also known for his incredibly inventive use of samples and like weird samples. Mm. Like if you think of sort of like the Bangra drums on Get Your Freak On Mm. and that like weird kind of like call like that happens at the beginning of that song. You know, that kind of stuff. There was that Twitter thread, though, just comparing the songs to basically the songs that he ripped off from. um, There are like four songs from the Middle East. And then basically like, yeah, so this is basically all Timbaland's discography. I remember that. But like in terms of introducing the U.S. to those sounds, I mean, we had that entire trend because of Timbaland, basically. And that was huge. Mm. That was huge. Like even even yeah. Rena's referencing that now in like things like excess. She's specifically hearkening back to that particular time period too. Like that's her thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that like 
there's like a lot of similarities between what they were doing in terms of like create like kind of like exploring the possibilities of computerized R&B music but like there's there's definitely like they're very distinctive sounding like I don't think you would confuse their sounds in that early period yeah. mm-hmm. interestingly enough I think Timberland made great but perhaps less dynamic and fascinating work in you know with Justin Timberlake and Nelly Furtado in the mid 2000s that like you know is a little bit a little more centrist sounding but he in particular, was making incredibly bizarre pop music that was getting over. And, like, that's, I think, another reason why Timberland, like, maybe stands as, like, perhaps one of the greatest producers of all time. It's like, you know, songs like Get Your Freak On and Pony and Are You That Somebody and so many of those Missy Elliott songs and, you know, uh, Dirt Off Your Shoulder. Like, these are supremely strange, you know, mainstream pop hits, like, when you really dig beneath the surface. So... There was something about what he was doing that was like genuinely like avant garde. And I think that's also why, you know, there have been artists, although he's never really been successful at doing this, like avant garde artists have turned to him. Like he made an album with Bjork at one point, you know, mm. MIA was obsessed with mm. him. Like, you know, they, I don't think he's ever been able to really spin off a successful collaboration with another sort of avant garde artist because I think Timberland has works well when he sort of pairs his sort of left of center instincts with like a real pop thinker you know yeah. i think that's like what's made these songs amazing but these those beats like i mean the get your freak on beat is one of the most wild pieces of pop production that has ever existed and i think to this day stay, seems as bonkers today as it did when it came out in 1999 or 2000 whenever that was and it's j- like just as recognizable Oh, for sure. Today, too. Yeah. And nothing sounds like it. I mean, there's like, I mean, like for something that's been so successful and lived on in infamy, it's like very hard to copy. Like Mm. no one, no one has really, like no one's really been able to copy that sound. I mean, I think that's part of the reason. I mean, uh, not to like, you know, look into his head and, and say that this is what he was doing for sure. But I think part of the reason why it was so successful to do beatboxing and to do vocal elements as part of the actual instrumentation is because you can't just recreate that you know you can pick up a guitar and play the same thing that led zeppelin played or whatever you know maybe not as well but you can still do it but you can't literally get timbaland's uh uh you know like (laughs) or like like just these different sort of was that you doing apologize by one republic it was good i like how you could tell i thought it was (laughs) say it right by nelly furtado it's It's both both. probably the same sample yes (laughs) yes (laughs) but that's that's the thing is like i think that that's part of the reason why it's so unique like i know that when i'm making songs and i'm working with producers that like really think outside the box some of the stuff that we'll do is use my voice as you know part of the bass line or some sort of instrumentation so that it's truly like individual sounding Mm. Interesting. Yeah, and I also think it takes a really like outside the box thinker to think rhythmically in the way that Timberland mm. thinks. Like that is, you know, as as uh, you know, most people trying to create a pop hit are going to make something that's very seems very accessible to people. You know, that's one of the the great achievements of Timberland that I always come back to is like he really pushed the boundaries of like what a you know top five Billboard hit could sound like. Like that was, mm. you know, it somehow still feels accessible, but it's very. The, the rhythmic strangeness of Timberland's beats, I think, is one of the things that will like keep him in the Hall of Fame forever because it's like mm-hmm. that's hard to pull off and still feel like you're enjoying a pop song and not like being forced to think too much. Yeah. And you like kind of described Pharrell and Timbaland as like opposite sides of the coin, which I completely agree with. I mean, one's very maximalist, one's very minimalist, but they're all often associated together just because, I mean, even before you realize that they're related and work together and like grow up together <laughs> because they just had like similar kind of rides and they'd always worked on like the same albums. Like Mm -hmm, you have the Justin Timberlake justified album. Mm. And then you also have Mm -hmm. Beyonce's self-titled. All of Jay-Z's albums. Yeah. 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 All of Jay-Z's late nineties into the early two thousands albums. They were almost always both of them on them. Really? Cause I I found that it was like one album was, I think the first album was Mm -hmm. Timbaland and, or like the, the 1999 album. And then album was Pharrell and then one album was Pharrell and one was Timbaland and then one was Pharrell and it's like oh my gosh 
They're keeping it in the family. I'm thinking of like change clothes on the black mm. album and dirt off your shoulder on the black album. I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Or on the blueprint too. I think there was like numerous contributions by both of them. But yes, they were often grouped together. Yeah, like Madonna's Hard Candy and stuff. Beyonce's Blow remix is kind of the only thing I can think of just having like them like being that kind of uniting between the two of them. Like this is something that they're both working on. Like that's just the latest example I can think of. And that was like 2013. So like nine years ago, Mm -hmm. would the world implode if they started a super group or like, would that even make any sense? It'd be like the musical Avengers. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I think the reason that they're often grouped together, aside from what I sort of laid out before and like in terms of what that generation of producers were doing is something that you have to sort of like contextualize this under Mm -hmm. is this was also the moment when hip hop crossed over into mainstream popular music in Mm. America in a way that it had never happened happened before. So like what they were doing was essentially creating the sounds of like true crossover hip hop sounded like. And that's like what those Missy Elliott songs represent. That's what the big Jay-Z records represent that, you know, like, I just want to love you. Give it to me. I'm thinking of, I'm, again, I'm thinking of Dirt Off Your Shoulder. I'm thinking of Nelly's Hot In Here. Yes. I'm thinking of Fa- Fabulous's Young In, whatever that song, you know, like there's so many songs here that were taking hip hop artists and aesthetics and truly giving them like the sheen of a mainstream pop hit, not Mm. sort of like harder edge songs crossing over, like not necessarily like Biggie having hits with Juicy and stuff like that, which, you know, again, for Biggie was like a pop sounding hip hop song, but still was like rooted in like fundamentally being a rap song. Mm. The, what they were doing was like giving hip hop a true sort of like pop sheen and like showmanship value. And I think that that's an oft, often reason that they're lumped together in that way. Yeah. I think one thing that's really interesting that I only found out when I was researching for this episode is that the Neptunes were protégés of Teddy Riley, who for listeners who don't know is the creator of New Jack Swing. And to have been protégés of someone who like literally started a genre and something that's even, you know, sustained into the present, if at all. Do you think that that being influenced by someone so innovative, do you think that that maybe created the Neptunes that we know today in some way? Like, obviously not to give him all this credit, but I just found that to be a really interesting thing that I wasn't aware of. Absolutely. I mean, Teddy Riley was the precursor to everything that we're talking about. Teddy Riley and New Jack Swing were the first sort of like, you know, the movement prior to the Neptunes. Yeah, exactly. And Timberland of sort of like mainstreaming and popifying, you know, R&B and hip hop tradition, you know, so... There's no question that Teddy Riley softened the ground for them and was an incredibly important innovator in this way. I mean, think about Teddy Riley producing Dangerous by Michael Jackson, Mm. biggest pop artist in the world. There's no question. And also, I think the sort of skeletal nature of Teddy Riley's productions, which are also kind of like centered around minimalism and like these really percussive, you know, drum sounds and whatever, Mm. like that all feels definitely of a piece. And there's no question that in many ways... Timberland and, and Pharrell are deaf and, and, and also like we shouldn't undermine Pharrell as a songwriter yeah. who also has like an incredible gift with melody and you know is definitely coming off the back of a lot of those like turn of the 80s into 90s producers like yeah. Teddy Riley, Babyface, Dallas Austin, again, Jermaine Dupree kind of bridges these gaps. So I think there's absolutely 100% like kinship between the two of them. And it makes a lot of sense that they would be connected in that way. Yeah, I thought so too. Like what you've said exactly. Like I thought that it made perfect sense that they would have been protégés of someone so influential in crossing the gap that was existing at the time between Mm -hmm. R&B, hip hop and pop music more generally for sure for one sure. element that we haven't really necessarily discussed yet one thing that i became aware of through working with different producers and stuff is sort of like the pharrell start to a song yes but dun, yes dun, dun, yes dun. the first three beats are always this the four the four beats like it goes the bar on, it right starts before. on the four beat yeah yeah i love mm-hmm. that it's great. What's the first song that comes to your mind when you think of that intro? Milkshake. Oh, uh, yeah. Mine is Four Times Four by Miley Cyrus. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do, 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 do. That's so funny. I unfortunately thought of Blurred Lines because we were just talking oh, yeah. about it. <laughs> Everybody get up. Repress it. Repress it. Oh, no. I was thinking of Get It Right by Miley Cyrus. No, Sorry. both 4x4 four four and Get It Right yes, both they, do it. they both do that. <laughs> and so does uh, Successful by Ariana Grande. I think. Yes. Or, sweet, or Sweetener. One of them. I forget. So does Candy Shop by Madonna. Yes. So many. So many. Yeah. I think part of it maybe comes from Pharrell 
being a drummer and this is something that i'm going to come back to in a lot of different producers i think that the best producers are also drummers percussionists because there's are you saying this because your producer is a drummer or percussionist no no most of the best producers i've ever worked with used to be drummers mm. Mm. understanding rhythm at a very basic fundamental level is something that is undeniable as a skill set necessary for for production. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Before we move on to the next person, I just want to ask something that I kind of think we should ask with all of them, which is what, in your opinion, is the greatest contribution to pop music that these producers have contributed? Like as a song or like a concept? Either a song or a concept. I would say. But I think as a concept for me, I would say just for both of them together, it would be the, you know, bringing hip hop into pop music, mainstream pop music. Yeah. But as a song, probably hot in here for Pharrell. Hard to fight with that. Probably Holla Back Girl for me. Mm. God, there's so many good ones. So it's an underrated Timberland album is Brandy's Aphrodisiac. Incredible yes. album. I'm like really into that album right now. So mine for Timberland, I think would be... Future Sex Love Sounds. Yeah, I was going to say that. Mm. That Justin Timberlake album. I feel like that's a pretty big contribution because that changed pop music. That affected so much. They brought Sexy back and it stayed, you know? (laughs) Yeah, Sexy wasn't there before. (laughs) Not for a long time. No, it was there and then it left and then it came back and then it stayed. (laughs) (laughs) Remember, if Sexy never left, then why is everybody on my dick? Yeah, hear that, Prince? Take notes. Anyway, so (laughs) our first Scandinavians of the day, folks, are the record producing and songwriting team known as Stargate. Composed of Tor Hermansen and Mikael Eriksson and hailing from Trondheim, Norway, this super duo's ability to span multiple genres is notable, having hits in R&B, hip hop, dance pop, Euro pop and pop pop. You might not have heard of this duo, but you definitely have heard of the artists they've worked with and songs they've made. Stargate have produced or written for Beyonce, Rihanna, S Club 7, Celine Dion, Janet Jackson, Mary J. Blige, Neo, Katy Perry, Whitney Houston, Charlie XCX, and so many more, including Elvis. Elvis? (laughs) Elvis. Elvis. Oh, same thing. Same thing. Stargate got their mainstream start in 1999, producing Britain's premier kids pop group, S Club 7. Following that success, Success, Stargate proceeded to find success in Europe, producing for multiple now legendary British acts, Blue, Jay Sean, and Atomic Kitten. They broke into the American recording industry in 2001 with the release of One Night Stand by British multi platinum girl group Mystique, which peaked within the top five of the Billboard dance charts. In 2006, Stargate had their first Hot 100 number one single with So Sick, produced and written by the team and performed by Neo. They made their permanent mark on the American music industry when they produced and co wrote Beyonce's worldwide hit single, Irreplaceable, which topped the Billboard Hot 100 for 10 consecutive weeks. In 2010, Stargate produced and co wrote Firework for Katy Perry. Throughout their career, they have been noted for their extensive work with Rihanna, writing and producing four consecutive Billboard Hot 100 number one singles with the Barbadian singer in 2010 and 2011. Prolific in their range and abilities, Stargate have a total of 10 songs go to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. What a group. Whenever I think of Stargate, I think of that. What does the fox say? No, the grip they had on 2007, like that year in particular. Mm-hmm. Just just because of Rihanna. No, well, it, <laughs> I think it was actually all because of Neo, because they, mm. for Brits, they're going to know them from Atomic Kitten. They're going to know them from Blue. They're going to know them from S Club 7. Like, I just think that's very interesting because like in the US, they didn't really blow up until So Sick with Neo. And they kind of did all of Neo's hits. And then they also got to work with Beyonce with Irreplaceable, which Neo wrote. And then they also had their first Rihanna hit as a Neo feature. Yes. No, and he also wrote Unfaithful before that. Yeah, exactly. So like Neo was the great connector. Where would Stargate be without Neo? Yeah, literally. Like they would not be writing Jordan Sparks and Chris Brown hits. I tell you what. So <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I think Neo, funny enough, I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if he wrote No Air. Like the third member of Stargate. Yes, Neo is Stargate. <laughs> I agree. I think that I actually think that that's like not an 
an inaccurate thing to say. I mean, especially in like the pre-EDM era, yeah. I guess. Like maybe that's when Neo went like by the wayside and they had a hits without. Let me love you with Stargate. Yeah, no, they, I definitely feel like the Stargate thing is defined by sort of like the contrast, in fact, between the sort of like icy sort of Nordic mm. take on R&B yeah. paired with the warmth of an American R&B singer like Neo. I mean, that's mm. kind of like what I think of as like the signature contrast. I mean, anybody listening to this episode, I highly recommend you go pick up John Seabrook's book, The Song Machine. Mm. John Seabrook is a writer for The New Yorker who did an exhaustive and incredible book about the way that the modern pop song machine works, like how songs come together for pop songs over the last 25 years or so. And it sort of begins with Max Martin and his mentor, Dennis Pop, and it goes all the way through, I don't know, probably like 1989 era Taylor Swift, I think. It came out like in 2016 or so. And he talks about in that book, we'll talk about this, I guess, when we talk about Max Martin, but how Max Martin was sort of like initially aiming at making R&B songs. Yeah. Like he really wanted to be making like basically like Hit Me Baby One More Time was written for TLC. Yeah. You know, he that's who he had in mind for that. Like he thought he he was making Tony Braxton songs. It is kind of interestingly like funk at its core. For sure. Oh, for sure. It, it is. I mean, th- those early Max Martin songs sound like direct descendants of like, again, like Babyface and all of the TLC songs and whatever, but was not particularly like good at that. He was so kind of like, he took elements from that, but at the end of the day, the song sounded so European and so pop oriented mm-hmm. that they ultimately could only end up with these white people. Like only Britain <laughs> could do that. Like TLC wasn't going to make that song. You know what I mean? only like a teen white girl was going to be able to like make that song. So what he kind of posits is that sort of Stargate in their early iteration was sort of achieving what Max never could, which was actually striking some sort of like, because they were younger and they grew up in the hip hop generation, like able to sort of like actually make R and B music like that black people wanted to participate in. And like, so I, that's always stuck with me when I think about Stargate because unlike Max Martin, who like really, you know, until the weekend is not super known for like working with black artists, generally speaking, mm. you know, they were really able to actually access the R&B space, the true center of it with Neo, with mm. Mario, with early Rihanna, with that era of Beyonce. Yeah. Yeah. Jordan Sparks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I always find that really interesting because the music still sounds incredibly icy and Norwegian to me when I listen (laughs) to it. But it's it's paired with that soul singing that really like makes the contrast work, I think. It's Neo. Neo is the key to their second act, I think. But also I was reading uh, and apparently they were listening in their free time, like they were obsessed with hip hop and they were listening to like so much hip hop. Yeah. And everyone else around them was (laughs) obviously Norwegian so they were listening to like dance pop and euro (laughs) pop and so they they had Mm -hmm. both of those worlds kind of collide with their actual interests being in hip hop and then their more um, I guess like immediate surrounding being based in pop so I guess you can actually like genuinely hear that collision in what they've put out except for the Fox by Elvis (laughs) (laughs) I like actually didn't know that they made that song yeah, me either. They make quite a few Elvis songs. And I only know that because I lived with a bunch of Norwegians. And obviously, they're very proud of Stargate. And so they were like, you know, the fox? That's Stargate. You know? And like, I cannot tell you yeah, how many Norwegians God. said that to me. <laughs> like, so wow. I think I've like done everything I can to erase the fox from my memory. And, and <laughs> as you should, just, just skip that episode mm-hmm. of Glee. So... <laughs> To me, it's really interesting because unlike Pharrell and Timbaland, which had like eras of success where they were more prolific and eras where they were like maybe having less cuts, they still had that one particular sound. And then it like changes like a little bit. But with Stargate, I find it so interesting because they have like three distinct eras for me. They have so many sounds. Mm. Yeah. The first one was the S Club 7 stuff. Yeah. And then the second era was the Neo, Rihanna, like Beyonce stuff. R&B era. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like all of those are R&B ballads. Yeah. Like. Or mid-tempo. Yeah. They're actually like very much mid-tempo. Like they're allergic to, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're allergic to like really, really slow or really, really upbeat. Mm-hmm. Or they were up until like SM and Only Girl in the World. And that's when they kind of started getting into that interesting sort of turn of the decade kind of pop. And then they also made Black and Yellow by Wiz Khalifa and Peacock by Katy Perry. And that kind of like interesting. <gasps> and thing. Firework. Yeah. But Peacock was kind <laughs> of 
I th- well, Firework is still that mid tempo song to me, but like no, that's a, that's like 120 BPMs. That's a real that's a dance song. Oh yeah, you're right. Actually, yeah, I, I try to block that song out of my memory. I, <laughs> I know. So wow, boring. you really have a thing with Firework. I think it's so that's boring. like the and that and like in contrast to so many people who are like, I don't like Katy Perry, but like I definitely think Firework is like, you know I feel like you're kind of like the contrarian here. She had two guys kiss in the music video, and I was like ally and then other than that i'm like she can keep it (laughs) just to sort of yes and you i think it's really wild that the same group in one year did snm black and yellow and then all of a sudden firework and peacock i didn't know when those songs were coming out obviously i was a kid but i didn't know that those were the same duo making the songs Mm. there's a real cold precision to it all that links it together for me like Mm. it's very well made and very like crispy um Mm. sounding but like i sometimes find their productions lack warmth Mm. Mm. Interesting. Not always. I think like there's like the acoustic guitar on Irreplaceable, but I think that they've often searched for warmth in black R&B vocalists. Yeah, I think. Mm, I'm going to listen back and think about that when I when I listen. Like think about the crispy drum production, even on like a song or even like the way that that harp plays on So Sick. Like it's so crisp and so like well made. Or Issues by Julia Michaels is like the epitome of that. Mm. It doesn't have the warm funk that like like traditional R&B music has to it. Maybe that's why I wasn't responsive to the Sam Smith songs. Uh, So they also did Too Good at Goodbyes and Dancing with a Stranger by Sam Smith. And those songs felt cold to me relative Mm -hmm. to Sam's previous releases. It makes sense also that they worked because of this, that they worked well in EDM, which like really relishes kind of like a certain like iciness, you know, like a song Mm -hmm. like Only Girl in the World like sort of is obviously it's got that big, amazing choral vocal from Rihanna, but like the production and the sound of it like kind of relishes like icy dance diva, you know, and that Mm -hmm. like works well. (laughs) It makes sense to me that that worked for them. But like, I guess Firework is a warm song. So maybe it's not totally true, but I always just think of them as like super precise and crisp and like almost cold to the touch. Peacock makes me feel warm inside. Yeah, Peacock. <laughs> I mean, that's TMI, Megan. <laughs> I'm using your government name. <laughs> Their third act was like a very interesting like mashup of things they've done before, I feel like, because they did like Black Widow by Iggy Azalea, Black and Yellow by Wiz Khalifa, like stuff like that i feel like was a l- treading a little bit of new territory but a lot of the stuff like too good at goodbyes and issues by julia michaels like these were i think just kind of like a lot of it was like they kind of have their stamp on like a mid tempo ballad like yeah. i'm just going to let the singer just be super emotional and i'm just like i have enough to keep you interested in the song while also having it be a piano song. Right, like getting out of the way in a sense. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I see that. In terms of my favorite contribution from them to pop music, I actually don't know, but I think it would be maybe So Sick by Neo. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else to say. Just because I think it had that chain of events of just So Sick to Miss Independent to Irreplaceable to Unfaithful, like all that. I love those Neo songs so much. Like I do not have the words to express to you. I think So Sick is like one of my top 10 favorite songs of all time. I fucking... Oh, it's so good. Absolute perfection. Just an utterly perfectly written R&B song. Perfect song. He's an amazing writer. And incredible vocalist. And Mm. I think that really express that song expresses to me why the sort of like coldness of the sort of like Nordic men and the warmth of this soul singer works so well at the contrast. Mm. Like really it it reaches its like apex with that for that to me. And the other one I have to just also throw out is Rude Boy, which I continue to think is the best Rihanna singer. Rude Boy. So true, actually. That's actually a really good point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's hard. It's hard to pick the best Rihanna single. See, she has it's like the, probably the best single discography of all time. But like, it's true. if I had a gun to my head, that's what I would pick. Yeah. I would say for me, I mean, I've already expressed my love for Peacock, but <laughs> also... And the Fox, of course. Yes, of course. Diamonds, I know that I'm like a super basic bitch saying that, but like that song makes me feel shit. I don't think there's any shame in liking Diamonds. No, not, not at all. Diamonds is a great song. So speaking of mid-tempo... <laughs> 
Hailing from New Jersey, Jack Antonoff is a singer, multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, and record producer. Jack was a guitarist and drummer in the Grammy Award-winning pop rock band Fun and currently performs under the stage name Bleachers. Aside from his work with Bleachers and Fun, Jack is now most celebrated for his work as a songwriter and record producer with various artists including Taylor Swift, Lord, St. Vincent, Florence and the Machine, Lana Del Rey, Fifth Harmony, Carly Rae Jepsen, The Chicks, I Could Continue, proving himself to be the latest super producer impacting the soundscape of contemporary pop music. Jack has been nominated for a Golden Globe and won six Grammy Awards, including the 2022 Grammy for Producer of the Year. He has also won Grammy Awards for his work with Fun, his production on Taylor Swift's albums 1989 and Folklore, for production on Art Rock Songstress, St. Vincent's album, Daddy's Home, and one with St. Vincent for co-writing the title track on Mass Seduction. With all his releases with Taylor Swift, Lord Lana Del Rey, The Chicks, Florence Machine, and the 1975, Jack is considered one of the hottest pop producers around right now. I think personally, like, Jack is such an interesting example of a super producer because I feel like more than anyone, he's captured such a unique niche in the pop world, and that niche is the gays pop heads he's essentially curating <laughs> the playlists of the introspective gays like his production discography literally <laughs> reads like a pop heads playlist shout out spotify who just made pop heads mix one of their editorial playlists or whatever yes i think ag cook and charlie xx are also really good examples of really like making the most of a certain scene and building on an extended universe within that niche mm. with all like charlie's features and stuff but mm. do we feel like there are any other niches that could use use like an all connecting Jack Antonoff type figure right now. Oh, so this is not about Jack. Kind of like he presents such a specific place in the pop world. And it's like you've either heard barely any of his songs or you've heard every single one that he's ever produced. I feel like it should be said that like as I'm thinking about all of this right now, I just feel like unlike the two previous or three, sorry, previous or I guess maybe four previous producers that I've <laughs> talked about. There's no sound. Like I, I just I just feel like Jack's thing that makes him singular is less like what he does in terms of like putting his own stamp on it as it is about like somehow creating a safe space for these songwriters who like want to work with somebody that's like the opposite of the sort of cliche Svengali male producer mm. and want somebody that's just going to be there to kind of like nurture and like as I in a way get out of their way and just sort of like accent what they're doing because you think about like Norman fucking Rockwell and then you think about like I wish you would and then you think about like mass seduction and you think about gaslight I'm just like What's the sound? I, I don't totally hear one myself. I think that the sound maybe is something really rooted in nostalgia. Mm. I think that relative to the other producers we've been talking about where they're trying to sort of mend genres together and maybe move it in a certain direction and like really trying to sort of think outside the box like not to you know shit on what jack has done but i feel like a lot of what he's doing is to sort of mend the past into the modern sound like i just feel whenever i listen to his songs except for maybe his work with fun and some mm, no still bleacher stuff like it just sounds very nostalgic it sounds well fun does too i think I think they I think that's true of fun too, no? Yeah, I just mean like relative to, you know, like his stuff with Right, like the eighty like the eighties, the yeah. specific eighties yeah. sounds of some of the yeah. Taylor songs and right. A lot of his early bleachers stuff is like roller coaster and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. I just feel like it's very tied to this sort of modern day young person obsession with nostalgia that's been, you know, happening. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's a good point. I think that's true. And I also think it's about feeling like he let he his songs are about kind of like big emotional feeling and like pathos and catharsis <laughs> like yeah i mean you would agree though that like he contrasts with some of the other people we were talking about in this way like i feel like totally. it's more an approach and a brand of artists as aj was talking about than yeah. it is about like you hear a song and you're like that's jack antonoff you know what i mean it's like i listen to norman fucking rockwell and i'm like the production on this is stunning but i'm not necessarily like the production on this is jack antonoff it's still lana del rey for sure yes exactly i do feel like there's something that pop has is picked up on that maybe i haven't picked up on yet but like when a new jack antonoff album comes out like an album that he's produced for another artist 
it is interesting that there seems to be this some connective tissue between his works. Like puppets can hear that people are being Jack Antonoffified. I mean, I can hear that with the 1975's new stuff, to be fair. Yeah, I, I mean, like I haven't listened to the new 1975 stuff, actually. It sounds much more like Jack Antonoff than it does old the 1975. Mm. It sounds much more in his vein. But yeah, I guess back to my central question, like are there any other niches that can be filled by like a Jack Antonoff type figure? I have an answer for that. I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, mm -hmm. I think it would be really interesting if a producer came through the woodwork and all of a sudden had like Lizzo, Doja Cat and that sort of like world of these like strong in your face, loud women, <laughs> me, me being one of them. So it's not it's no diss. Interesting. I thought you were either going to go in terms of like disco songs like new disco or in terms of which I guess Dr. Luke is kind of doing that. Exactly. Also S. G. Lewis. And also that like Ricky Reed guy. Love, <laughs> love yeah. Ricky Reed. It feels to me that like outside of the Jack space, like in the more sort of like centrist space, like producers in general feel less important than ever. I was thinking about this with Beyonce's album because she has so many people work on all these songs that like you can't even call them anybody's specific. It's actually like mm. a brilliant strategy beyond just the product that it creates for her because it creates this thing where it's like, well, I can only think of this as a Beyonce song because like 30,000 people worked on this song. She is the super producer. That's true. Yeah, she's the super producer. It doesn't feel as though there's a person to your point, in this sort of mainstream pop space right now, I guess Dr. Luke aside, which is so complicated, there's no new producer, let's put it in that way, Yes, that like feels like they've taken on the role that Jack plays in the sort of like left of center alt pop girly space. I yeah. agree with that. There doesn't seem to be like some, there's nobody that like everybody's turning to for a hit right now, it feels like. Yeah. 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 Which is, it's true. Which is so interesting because I feel like if there was one for that new disco sound or if there was one for or rap girlies, or if there was one for even just doing the new pop rock stuff. Well, there is that like Ian Kirkpatrick guy also, right? That did like Don't Start Now and Say So. Uh, like, what did he do? No, he did like Don't Start Now and like Look At Her Now by Selena Gomez. I mean, I guess yeah. it's not really like. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean though. Like Ian Kirkpatrick is like, ugh, I love him and I wish we could have gone into length about him on this episode, but there's no time. But he's great. But I feel like he is a less specific sound. I agree. I think he's in the Greg Kirsten vein. What's funny is I was actually going to bring him up when I was talking about people I wouldn't name. Because <laughs> I think he's so omnipresent in terms of all these different things that he can do. And he does them all so right. well, but it's just not as Agreed. identifiable. Distinctive. Yeah. Which right. I guess is just his style. So what would you say is Jack's key element in his production? I think you nailed it with nostalgia, for me at least. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was really smart too. Yeah. Nostalgia and lots of space. He's the vinyl records obsession mm. of music producers. It's true. Yes. You have to buy what he makes on vinyl. <laughs> He serves the same function for people that are like, oh my God, like, I just want to like have the fantasy of like putting this crackling record on the player <laughs> in yeah. my like, you know, modern life. Like, I feel like he represents that as a music maker. Mm. And also I can hear that he uses, a, I know that this is maybe sounds silly, but relative to some of uh, other producers and other production from some of the artists that he's worked with, like I can really hear that he uses a lot of hardware. So as opposed to like virtual instruments, mm. like, cause a lot of the sounds aren't too dissimilar from track to track, artist to artist, like maybe like a really subtle synth in the background of like mm -hmm. a, a Lana song might sound relatively similar to like a synth in the background on a Lord song mm. or, or things like that. Like, or maybe not Lord, maybe the 1975 would be a better example, but I don't know if that's just me like sort of trying to find something besides nostalgia. Yeah. But I think that, I think that maybe that could be some sort of element is that he's less like using samples, less using all these different things and sort of bringing it back to the sort of basics with hardware bringing that nostalgic element yeah i definitely see that as like a subset of the nostalgia thing but then also just like having a lot of space like all of his songs just like mm. they feel like the room is just like huge you know what i mean mm. they feel like they're all recorded mm. in like this like reverb chamber <laughs> choir i don't know 
Oh, I, I do you think? Yeah, that? absolutely. Especially with his bleacher stuff, like his solo bleacher stuff. But with solar power, I don't know. Yeah, solar power, like is, his bleachers, is, is yeah. less so. I would say. I can't. Do we have to? We. I don't think solar power is not canon. <laughs> solar power is not yeah. canon. Yeah. I don't want to talk about solar power. <laughs> Let's not, the less we say about solar power, the yes. better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say that's the connection between his like pop stuff with Taylor Swift and like his bleachers stuff and like, you know, the stuff that he would do for, you know, Troy Sivan or whoever. Or Lana. Yes. What do we think is the single greatest contribution that he has introduced into the pop sphere? I would say maybe his best contribution is his work with Taylor on 1989 and Ivy. I think that that's probably his best. I would like to say four things. Yeah. (laughs) One is... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> One is, I think perhaps his greatest contribution is being the sort of emblematic post Me Too pop producer where he is, it's mm. more of a cultural thing. Clearly, he has created a space as a straight male producer where like very, like, sorry, this sounds like so cliche, but like independent women, whatever, like women with their own voices feel safe coming to him and nurturing their ideas with him in a way that like Mm -hmm. breaks the mold of the like Svengali pop producer. I think that that's Mm -hmm. a very important contribution that he's like created a cultural shift in the studio, perhaps. My three things that I would say are the best things that Jack has done for me personally are as follows. One, the second half of Reputation, the best Taylor Swift album, which I will include Getaway Car, Call It What You Want, whatever, all of those songs. I love those songs so much. Two, Norman fucking Rockwell, one of the greatest albums of the century, in my personal opinion. And as I will also hand that same title to Melodrama as well. Yes. So what I was going to say was Dope by Fifth Harmony. It was the obvious answer. (laughs) I'm like racking my brain for what dope sounds like in my head. I like can't think of it. I just cannot believe that Julia Michaels and Justin Tranter wrote that song. Yeah, Julia Michaels, Justin Tranter, and Jack Antonoff all in a room together. And Fifth Harmony. It doesn't sound anything like any of them. It's so strange. Mm -hmm. My point is, I think melodrama was... Just because it came before Norman fucking Rockwell, like I feel like mm-hmm. Norman is maybe the epitome of a Jack Antonoff album, but melodrama, just in terms of its impact on the people who are his like core fan base, I guess, or his like core yeah. listenership, I guess uh-huh. the impact of them is just so strong. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that that's the quintessential Jack album. Yeah, Mm. for sure. And it's also just so fucking good. Like, it is so good. That album is so amazing, and it only highlights how bad Solar Power is, and I'm sorry to keep harping on that. We should move on to... To Dr. Dre? Yeah. So Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is an American rapper, hip hop producer and entrepreneur who helped popularize gangsta rap. In 1986, he founded NWA with fellow rappers Easy e and Ice Cube. The group's 1998 album Straight Outta Compton was a breakthrough for the budding gangster rap movement, featuring explicit descriptions of gang life, sex, street violence, police brutality and drug dealing. While Dre appeared prominently as a rapper in NWA, his most celebrated role was as a producer, crafting ambitiously noisy, multi-layered sonic collages to back the group's provocative lyrics. NWA is widely credited with not only pioneering and popularizing the gangster rap subgenre of hip-hop music, but also increasing the prominence of the West Coast hip-hop scene while helping to differentiate it from East Coast hip-hop. Dre left NWA in 1992 and co-founded Death Row Records with Suge Knight. That year, his solo debut, The Chronic, introduced the G-Funk, aka Gangsta Funk, production style characterized by slow moving beats, synthesizer washes, and copious musical samplings of 1970s funk records, especially those by the legendary music collective Parliament Funkadelic. The multi-platinum success of The Chronic led to it becoming one of the most influential works in hip-hop from the mid-1990s onward. Not only as an artist in his own right, but he is widely considered to have launched Eminem's career, producing the likes of My Name Is, The Real Slim Shady, and Just Lose It. The only Eminem songs I claim. Rude. Beyond Eminem, Dre's 
<laughs> produced works by Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent, Mary J. Blige, Eve, and Gwen Stefani, just to name a few. So, so Dre. I'm really interested in Dre specifically because he's had such a big impact on pop without actually working with many of what people would consider necessarily like straight up pop stars. I would say the one exception would be Gwen Stefani because he has like an Alicia Keys album track, but like Gwen Stefani he has like two singles of. And what do we think about that? Like where did that come from? Was that Gwen's idea to start working with a hip hop producer? Was that his idea because he really liked Gwen's style during the, the ska stuff? Or like, was it because they were both Eve collabs and it was like a package deal thing because he was working with Eve and trying to break her at the time? I think that it's important to underscore here, like something that we were touching on during the Pharrell and the Neptunes conversation and Timberland conversation, which is that Dre, in his own way, also played an incredibly important part in you know, crossing hip hop over. And, you know, I think that one thing that gets Mm. sticky over here is that rappers in America are pop stars. And I think we need to like, make sure that we say that in this conversation. Like we absolutely are a culture in which this central genre of music in the year 2022 is not pure pop music. It's hip hop music, like straight Mm. up. So like, I think that we, can think about Dr. Dre in a pop space less so because he's like worked with a ton of traditional pop stars, as you've pointed out, he hasn't. And more so because those records, those early, not necessarily NWA, although NWA did have mainstream success, but I'm really more thinking about the songs on The Chronic with Snoop Dogg Mm. and Snoop Dogg's debut record, Doggy Style, which when it came out in 93, I believe was like the most successful hip hop record of all time to that point and had like literally a panoply of top 10 hits here. Like, you know, Who Am I? What's My Name? And Gin and Juice. And like, these were sort of like really smooth, seductive, kind of like turning hip hop. I think of like Dr. Dre as like hip hop's Mozart. Like Mm. there's so many layers to what's going on. He's almost Mm. like he approaches hip hop with like a classical music mind or something like that. And I think that like that sort of uber smooth, sexy, seductive, somewhat dangerous, but in a really accessible way, style that he pioneered in those kind of early 90s records was a critical element in hip hop's crossover into like mainstream America and into like, you know, unfortunately, because of our racial divides into like want white radio into like white spaces that has now proven to like be just, you know, utterly baked into the DNA of American pop popular music culture. So I think that I think that that's how we can think about him as a pop space. In terms of the Gwen Stefani question, Gwen Stefani was like Mrs. Cultural Interloper to end them all in that time period. I mean, <laughs> she was she was literally spent that entire era and like, God bless her. I mean, I loved that album. It was like truly one of the most formative pop albums for me in my life. But looking back on it, I mean, Mama was out here literally like plucking up these girls from Japan and carrying them around as ornaments and was like really like truly one of patient zeros and kind of like the white girl rap appropriation movement like the iggy azalea before iggy azalea although it didn't like come across that way necessarily at the time but like that's love angel music baby was like definitely i think we look back on it now and go like a little bit with like what she was doing in terms of her appropriations of hip-hop culture and i think that's a complicated topic and i'm not like condemning her necessarily and i think rich girl and let me blow your mind are both like iconic incredible songs and she's great on them and she was also i think important to say and maybe this gives us insight into how dr dre thinks about this stuff she was the cool person's pop star at that time, mm. yeah. you know? So she was like definitely like an alternative to Britney or Jennifer Lopez in that moment in the sense mm. that she was like, she came from this band that had a lot of credibility. And when she embarked on her solo career, we talked earlier about kind of the alt pop space. I think she's also, that record is a crucial linchpin in sort of the idea of like, I'm making pop, but it's weird and idiosyncratic and like has my own real like personality and stamp on it. Mm. I think that she represented that in the mid 2000s and that's maybe why he felt comfortable working with her and maybe he wouldn't have wanted to work with Britney, you know? Yeah, I always just find that very interesting because, and if we're talking about his footprint on pop music and the crossover, I mean, even more so than with traditional hip hop stars, it was like traditional R&B stars too, like Mary J. Blige, like Family Affair. Family Affair and Into Club, you called him the hip hop Mozart. Those are really good examples of that. Like the orchestration on Mm. those two songs specifically like that blows my mind like that like 
actually just no pun intended yeah blow <laughs> he said let me blow your mind with this pun and it's so funny because you can actually see the dr dre influence on ashley tisdale's first album oh my god goodbye oh my god because literally every song like like you think like bye you think like be good to me and you think headstrong and you think he said she said and those are all really just like he said she said like you would think initially britney when you see it but they're all just like dr dre inspired which is so interesting that like that that's kind of like his extended footprint of like things he didn't work on i think even more immediately than that you can definitely hear it on like tony braxton's you're making me high that like squelching synthesizer noise on there is like straight up g-funk mm. dr dre sound and like so george michael's fast love also has that noise going i mean that sound with that g-funk sound with that like ding that sort of squelching synth noise, that was like permeating the sound of crossover R&B and hip hop and pop at that mm. moment. And if we're gonna connect all this together, you know, that's all the shit that Max Martin was looking at in Sweden in the mid uh, 90s and going like, I need to figure out how to do that. Mm. So there yes. is a direct connection <laughs> here between all of these things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and we'll get to Max Martin in a second, but before we go, I just wanna know what everyone's take on what the definitive project for Dr. Dre is. I think that's easily the second album. I mean, I think a lot of people would say The Chronic or Doggy Style, which I think are like yeah. totally reasonable choices. But for me personally, like if I was going to direct somebody to like listen to like what makes Dr. Dre incredible, it's 2001. His 1999 album, Dissonantly, um, <laughs> is uh, is a true masterpiece. I mean, it is literally like, first of all, if you grew up in that era, you're going to realize that you recognize every single song. Like the amount of hits on it are insane. Like, you know, Forgot About Dre, Still Dre, Next Episode, What's the Difference? It's like, you know, and as with classic Dr. Dre albums, you know, it's less about him front and center and more about like this sort of cast and roster of guest stars from Eminem to Snoop Dogg to like corrupt and it's like a calvin harris record mm, yes <laughs> or like a dj khaled record if dj khaled was like good at producing <laughs> if dj khaled touched a board at one point <laughs> yes ever so i think people might find the like lewdness of it and the misogyny of it very unsavory now because it is it's gross there's like a lot of like you know that was what gangster rap was largely about sort of throwing like unsavory un like uncouth things about violence sex misogyny homophobia mm. in your face and that record certainly has that and like i definitely look back on it now it, on something i thought was like really cool in that way and now like cringe at some of it but you have to marvel at the ambition of this thing it's it's so every beat is so state of the art still sounds incredible today so many classic songs on it it's really like something that i think everybody who cares about this stuff should go back and listen to it's truly one of the most state of the art albums of all time i think i would totally agree with all that you said i think that you know you can't mention dre without mentioning the chronic and doggy style but i do think that his work which i didn't know on supersonic with jj fad like that is hell yeah you stole my thing that's literally fergalicious and mm -hmm. then that sort of like descending rhythmic sort of chromatic melody and stuff is is just it's just a thing supersonic dun, 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 dun. <laughs> down the scale like that's i do that now like i fucking love that yeah the descending melody and and his you know synth choices like you were mentioning before and things like that like have just sort of sustained over time i do think that you know his co-sign of eminem has brought us eminem yeah eminem snoop Dre i mean he's one of the greatest like a and r people ever truly like, oh 100 yeah. percent. but i think he's the first person that we've mentioned out of all of the super producers that is also a real entrepreneur because he made beats by dre obviously right. and that was like the thing like if you were a cool it pop person in like 2010 you had beats in your music mm -hmm. video and yeah 
I think that like we can't really talk about Dre's impact without also talking about his impact on music video culture and electronics even you know like there's so much that Dre has done beyond just his production that I think will last I would like to just throw two more things out yes one I think so much of this is encapsulated in the fact that like Dr. Dre headlined the Super Bowl here this year which is the biggest stage in music and I think that speaks to his just massive impact on popular culture, generally speaking. Like, they don't give that slot to pretty much anybody. So, like, yeah. you know, the fact that he's getting the same slot that, you know, is is commonly occupied by Beyonce and Katy Perry and Justin Timberlake is, I think, very notable. And the second thing is I just think we shouldn't have this conversation without acknowledging the fact that he's been, like, credibly accused of domestic violence and abuse against, like, numerous people. And mm. I just feel like we shouldn't we shouldn't not say that when we're talking about him. Mm. It, it's pretty gross if you go read and Google it. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, you know, I actually didn't know that because mm-hmm. I just listened to the songs. I didn't really, like, look into Dre that much as, like, mm-hmm. an individual before researching this. And, yeah, we should definitely, definitely mention that. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. What about you, AJ? For me, it is Family Affair by Mary J. Blige. Just because... I knew you were going to say that. Mm, Like that and Indie Club are like almost tied for me just because they're the same kind of it's about like that loop. Mm -hmm. They had the Dr. Luke kind of one simple loop thing going on before Dr. Luke even knew how to, you know, pick up a guitar. So like it was like, I mean, probably around the same time, but it was like. And it's like just doing that is enough for me to be like that is just genius like i know that's true it's so simple and yet it stays within the the public consciousness for so long and uh i mean that is just like genius to me yeah that's so true it's a good point in the club too is like a real like exercise in the like impact of simplicity too like i love yes absolutely and and i throw still still dre in that beat still dre in that group too like that ding 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 that was such like a stroke of genius too you know and a lot of the early snoop dogg stuff yeah i'm gonna cut out all of these noises and make a huge like super comp at the end so just so everyone's aware Oh, fun. Love it. it. You're saying you don't want to hear my beautiful singing voice making all of these (laughs) noises. No, I'm saying I want to hear it on loop. So (laughs) our last super producer is none other than Swedish god Max Martin. Who? Yes, Swedish Jesus. (laughs) Max Martin is a Swedish musician, songwriter, and producer who helped write and produce dozens of the most celebrated pop records since the late 1990s. Max became an in-house producer at a Swedish record label called Sheyron and a protege of the label's founder, Dennis Pop. Following this, he got his first big break producing Eurodance songs for a rapper named Herbie in 1995. But his world domination began in 1995. and 1998 when he started producing songs for the debut albums of Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and Britney Spears. This iconic turn of the millennium pop sound defined a generation of teen stars heading into the early 2000s. However, by 2001, the sound he pioneered was starting to fade in the mainstream, and his next big hit wouldn't be until he teamed up with now notorious producer Dr. Luke to reinvent his sound. Together, they produced a string of pop rock hits for Kelly Clarkson, Pink, and Katy Perry between the years of 2006 and 2009, but as guitars began to fade out, then came time for a yet another reinvention, which was the maximalist sound, which he is associated with most today. This includes several hit songs on Katy Perry's 2010 album Teenage Dream, as well as electropop hits for Kesha, Usher, Britney Spears, Jesse J, and Maroon 5. Around 2014, he started shifting his roster again for what would be the rest of the 2010s and became the go to collaborator and I think piano teacher <laughs> for Ariana Grande. <laughs> as well as Taylor Swift and The Weeknd. If it seems like I'm listing every major pop star on the planet, it's because I am. <laughs> Max has written or co-written 25 Billboard Hot 100 number one songs, most of which he also produced or co-produced. In terms of number ones for songwriters, this puts him only behind Paul McCartney and John Lennon. It's crazy. Flops. Big flops. When it comes to number ones for producers, he's tied for first with George Martin, also known as the Beatles producer. Beyond this, he has won the ASCAP Songwriter of the Year Award a record 11 times. 
Casual songwriter of the year, 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even just 11 awards, it's 11 years. <laughs> it's really funny that like someone was fighting with you about whether he qualifies as a super bruiser is like, yes, that's a joke. Sorry, I don't know. Like, I can't take that seriously. <laughs> Suck it, Tomas. It's because he doesn't have like a quote unquote recognizable name because he tends to just stay in the background. I feel like in spite of himself, his name is recognizable. He has a whole musical about his song. And Juliet. Yeah, you're right. He has a whole musical dedicated to his work. But I don't know if that's because of him or just because people were like, oh, wait, there's an opportunity here because all of these were written by the same person. So let's just make a musical (laughs) and then just say that it's a Max Martin musical. Apparently, a lot of people were approaching him for it. And he was like, I will only do it if it's like the right script. I'll I'll stop with the extended lore. Go on. So what do you think the key elements of Max's production are? If there are any. Hmm. If there's one, if there's any that like go through the entire span of his career. I would point out maybe one. Go. I'd say actually a couple things. One, he does quite groovy bass lines. Not on everything, of course, but they move and you kind of move with them. Also, he has a lot of percussion elements that are sort of in the background. Like if you listen to the Into You stems, as I'm sure every normal person has. (laughs) I can't get enough of them. There are like glass percussion elements that you only just barely, barely, barely hear. But they really just move the beat forward in a way that can't just be achieved with just a normal drum kit. And I've noticed that on a couple other of his songs, it's not necessarily the same glass percussion, but there will be some sort of additional percussive element that is rather like sort of high frequency and helping to keep a groove. And you can include a lot of those like hits and stabs that happen like you would sort of hear in Backstreet Boys in sync, Britney Spears era as part of those like high frequency percussive elements. Like sometimes it's more sustained like in the Into You glass percussion. Sometimes it's just a couple hits that really add a sort of unique and ear catching element. Like a lot of his stuff just really it grooves. You know, obviously not every song, you know, Kelly Clarkson's songs don't really groove. <laughs> like, I was going to say. You, since since you've been gone doesn't really groove but i'm i'm thinking more like can't stop the feeling justin timberlake obviously can't feel my face and his work with ariana baby one more time definitely groove yeah i was gonna say baby one more time is a huge one and i think also what helps kind of make it special is that every frequency available in a track is filled with its own unique grooving element also he does a lot of backing vocals and a lot of the backing vocals will be like an octave or a fifth up and well actually like (laughs) the uh, combination of the two a lot of the time too Mm. that's something that he does a lot ed sherry you're not special and i know that that's a common trick but if we're talking like things that he does a lot that's like one of them and maybe it comes from working a lot with just groups and maybe he was influenced a lot by groups i'm not exactly sure but also a lot of his melodies I'm thinking like The Call by the Backstreet Boys. God is a woman. Hit me, baby, one more time. The melodies will just have like some juicy note, some kind of juicy moment where you go, ooh, what what just happened? Yes, more. He's not afraid of like a seventh, just sort of interesting harmony. And, And I think a lot of that comes from his love of R&B and hip hop like you were mentioning before Louis I think that you can hear that in what he does like it's not it's obviously pop music but I think that you can hear that he's trying to sort of give it that flavor a little bit I think that's also interesting and like you guys always fascinate me because you're songwriters and like you know about things that like I'm just like wow (laughs) I think like just on a macro level two things that I feel like are important are have to do with his reticence to take the spotlight, which are he's willing to do whatever it takes to create a hit. Mm. And that includes taking himself out of the equation in a lot of situations. So like, whether that means that he will work with anybody. Like one thing you'll see on Max Martin is he will he has so many protégés. And if you go through his production discography, there's like periods of time where like certain protégés just will be appearing over and over again, whether you're talking about like Circuit, Dr. Luke, Billboard, there's like a whole bunch of them and they'll sort of like come through. He has an entire actually like roster of producers that, that he sort of is the master for. Mm. Yeah. So that's one thing. I think that's also informed his ability to shift and move with the trends and times like he's not there to claim the spotlight he's there to create 
the most effective pop song for the moment. And that's mm. extended to both the sonic shifts that you very effectively laid out, Sola, in the intro, where he's kind of gone through these like four really distinctive epics where like his sound, I think, is identifiable maybe within each of those epics to some degree, especially in the earlier periods. But I think in the most recent epic, because pop stardom has once again circled back to being super personality driven and needing to at least have the feeling of authenticity or relatability or whatever it is like you know he's done a great job again i think of like dropping the svengali act and coming into the jack antonoff era of pop making where he sort of like molds himself around pop stars with existing worlds and personalities like the weekend like taylor swift like ariana grande he didn't like mm-hmm. create these aesthetics with them but he's kind of come in and given them the that the pop oomph that they need especially with Lizzo mm. yeah with all of them that's like I feel like that's his approach now I mean he was known in the Sharon era as a super Svengali like basically you come here you do this exactly as I wanted to I write the song I produce the song you know with my team and like Britney a lot of them have spoken about that like he he there's apparently a demo somewhere in the world of him singing baby one more time to the T like Britney sang it, like literally with every single harmony, inflection point, whatever, like somewhere that exists. And John Seabrook, who was on my show, heard it. Max Martin played it for him, but it's not on the internet. So leak it. Yeah, literally. So, (laughs) but that's not what he does anymore. Now what he does, I feel like is kind of like coming, like, you know, Taylor Swift's not coming into a studio and having Max Martin tell her what to do. She's coming into the studio and being like, here's my finished song. Let's make, you know, let put your spin on it. So he's done a really effective job of moving with the times in that way. And that has to do, I think, with his lack of sort of front and centerness. The other thing that I think we should bring up that's the through line, I think the 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 through line is the melodic math and the like lack of care for the English language. Yeah. He is Swedish. He does not give a fuck about things needing to be poetic. He doesn't need them to make sense. A lot of Max Martin's famous songs have nonsensical lyrics in them that make absolutely no sense. I mean, first, think about Hit Me Baby One More Time. What the fuck does that mean? It's like literally mm. completely confusing and so many people, including TLC, were confused by what, the, what he meant when they pitched them. What do you mean you hit me? Maybe one more time, hit me in the face. He, he needed one more word in there, which was hit me up one more time. Yes, but there, but no up. Or you think about I want it that way by the Backstreet Boys is nonsense. It makes absolutely so true. no yeah. sense. What we want it, what we want, what, what way? What, what are you talking about? And he was saying that those songs he wrote like, and he was really insecure about it. Like he's really insecure about all those songs because he's like, I wrote those on my own. Now I have other people, right? I have the artists writing them. Yeah, right. That's why he loved Bonnie McKee is what John Seabrook posited yes. is that he could like have somebody come in there who was like an American who could speak English or who could write the song. So, but th- but mm. this extends through his later work. It extends through now that I've become who I really are. Yep. I mean, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> it's phonetically just better. That's so true. Exactly. And it's the, it's the pursuit suit of that like melodic perfection mm-hmm. and the lyrics coming second to that that yeah. i think has w- been a huge element in his staying power like he's it's yes. it's uh, it all circles back to a lack of american ego i think mm. yeah i think there's also another big big thing about his music and it's that it's big yeah right it's like it's like the wall of sound yeah i, I think i think a big through line is that like you think of a it's gonna be me you think baby one more time you think since you've been gone you know hot and cold teenage dream into you all of his songs they're just like top notch like firing on all ends at at like some point in the song like they can be very reserved in some parts but he is not a minimalist no kind of guy like no no more is more <laughs> He will make a big song for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And gets to that chorus, like, fucking, like, yeah. as everything's in the service of getting to, like, we're not dilly-dallying. Like, he gets right to that chorus. Yeah, it's like within 50 seconds. A Max Martin chorus is gonna fuck you up, guaranteed. Totally. Well, that's why I think Girls by Lizzo is so interesting, because that does not sound at all like a Max Martin song. No. I literally despise that song. <laughs> I know you do, <laughs> because of your Twitter. I know so many people that do, which is really interesting. I just like can't fuck with her. I just I find her music like largely insufferable. But like that's a story for another day. Oh really? Oh wild. Yeah. But I was gonna say another like you were kind of talking about his henchmen a little bit. I mean they're not actually referred to as as his henchmen. I just think that's a funny word for it. <laughs> but like Doctor Luke, I guess is his first like main collaborator that was like under his guidance as opposed to like him being a protege of Dennis Pop right. or him being an equal with Rami Yacoub or something. Right. And so right. like 
Dr. Luke, he brought in in 2004, and I learned this from Pop Pantheon, brought him in because he knew the hip hop sound because Dr. Luke was doing hip hop before that. It was ironic. <laughs> and then Seven Kotecha working with him a lot in starting in 2007 and Shell back in 2008, which is like how we got that really, really clean sound that we know. Because their first collab was If You Seek Amy. <laughs> and all of their other stuff was like the Katy Perry stuff and like the Avril Lavigne, what the hell. And like blank space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like the very, right. like, you know, it was Shellback, it's going to be clean mm-hmm. no matter what. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, like, then he just kind of got in the hang of just bringing in people constantly. Benny Blanco, Ilya, who is mm-hmm. just like the Ariana Grande producer, right. in my opinion. Right. Ali Payami, who I was so... I'm actually upset to find out Ali Payami was was not a woman. (laughs) But I think that that's why I think his ability to bring in all these people, almost like an A&R, like bring in all Mm -hmm. these amazing producers and teach them his like melody is king ethos i think that that is like maybe a uh, part of the reason why his style has transcended himself beyond just the fact that he's made so many hits but also because he's teaching all of these future producers that have sort of gone on like benny blanco to even become their own super producer matt man and robin mm-hmm. yeah and like i just feel like there's maybe something to that as well the fact that he's teaching this younger generation it's almost like judo master more so than almost a and r yes I think. like i that's how i think of yes. him like he's like like he's that scene in like kill bill where the guy like lives in the mount on top of the mountain and she like comes to learn the ways like yes. that's like how i think of him a little bit yeah if we have another max martin in like 10 years if we have another max martin it will be someone who is trained by max martin mm, i think i agree there's something really interesting that i heard secondhand from someone whose friend went to write with max martin so i don't know how exactly accurate this is but it's really interesting to me and it makes sense to me based on what I already know about how he works. Everyone gives up their phone and it is locked away in a safe for the day. And then they go and they just make the melody for mm. a whole day. They just make melody and gibberish syllables to the melody. Mm. Then they leave and they don't do anything the next day. They, they don't make any music. And then they come back to the same song. They'll fix the melody, see if they like it. And then they'll put words that basically match those syllables because syllables are very important and vowel sounds and consonants where they hit. It's very important to how a melody flows. The words are almost used as like supporting the melody as opposed to being like their own independent thing. They're phonetically driven. Yeah. Yes, they're phonetically driven. Thank you for that. And I just think that there's something to that. I don't know if that's exactly correct. Bonnie, please let us know. Hmm. Yeah, Bonnie, hit us up. I think that there's maybe something to his dedication to melody and his dedication to making sure that all the words also support that melody that like we've come to have these amazing songs with these soaring fantastic choruses and you know everything fits together in this beautiful way that I think could only come from someone who's been trained in music from a young age. Mm. God bless the Swedish government's effort to make young, amazing musicians. I always come back to this thing with him. I do really feel strongly that there's like this Swedish ethos, this like pseudo socialist lack of ego that like is the driving Mm. force behind all this. Like there's nothing he's not willing to do in pursuit of the work. And that includes Mm. like an integral part of him not not being famous himself like I think that that's he's never cared for that like he's been always 100% about the product and like mm. it doesn't matter if there's 17 other people working on the song he doesn't care about that he doesn't care about you know whether he needs to draw from rock or hip hop or R&B or drum and bass or whatever the weird things he's ever drawn from like in all of his myriad productions like and there's been a lot like he's willing to sort of do whatever and like I think that comes from a, an entirely un-American lack of ego and like a socialist sort of working environment that he fosters in his like oh, you know, with that team I've always felt that that's like been critical to him and something that like so mm. few American artists could ever embody because we all crave fame so much <laughs> yes and I think also because like in Sweden the government has public funded music lessons and you can get those up until the age of 18 and also beyond that I don't know if this happened when Max was young, but I know that now and for quite a while now, if you have three or more people in a rehearsal room together, you can count that as work and the Swedish government will pay you as long as you document all the hours that you've done and they'll pay you like a minimum wage job. So like there's so much support built in the Swedish system for music that 
they've been that's why they've been so successful exporting so many amazing artists it's not because swedes have something in the water or something in their meatballs Mm -hmm. it's because like something in the meatballs it's something in the meatballs uh it's because they have this ethos like you were talking about the socialist ethos where it's like let's contribute to our society and Mm. give those among us who are talented the ability to succeed with what they're good at and also the soft power that is earned achieved whatever through exporting your cultural products like music is a very real thing i'm looking at you south korea and k-pop and that's been my ted talk so the conclusion here is we all need to move to sweden yes Yes, absolutely and i know that we have been picking our favorite contributions from each producer but for max martin we're gonna do something special because he is the last one we'll just go on our top five favorite max martin songs we'll just run through them my number five is kesha's crazy beautiful life (laughs) so i made video diaries as a kid and that was our theme song my number four is in sync's it's gonna be me i just think everything in that is just like insanely insanely tight and just crazy crazy good uh number three Allison Irohita's Friday, I'll Be Over You. Such an underrated song. Wow, these are some deep fucking cuts. Allison Irohita. <laughs> such. A, wow. it's, it was a single, but it was such a good song. And it's like it some of his best work, honestly. And then number two is Kesha's Come On. Mm, love Come On. One of the best Kesha songs. It is the best Kesha song, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that's released. I agree. And then the number one song is Avril Lavigne's What the Hell. Wow. My second favorite pop song of all time. <laughs> wow. 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 So for me, honorary shout out to Bang Bang, even though everybody hates it, including Ariana Grande for some reason. Even Everybody hates it except when it's on. It's so good. <laughs> when it's on, it's good. Okay. So my number five is Since You've Been Gone by Kelly Clarkson because duh, and that was my childhood. Mm-hmm. My number four was my MySpace song when I was like 11. And so it, and it introduced me to this wonderful, amazing artist that Louis hates. <laughs> it's I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry. I don't hate her. <laughs> How dare you continue to spread that falsity? Uh, we will until you let us do a Katy Perry episode. That's going to be the last episode of the show ever. <laughs> so number three is Oops, I Did It Again by Britney Spears. Number two is the fucking goat song of my life. I, I don't know why I phrase it like that. It's God is a Woman by Ariana Grande. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I knew that mm-hmm. was going to make your top five. It gives me Hercules muses. And my number one is a song that like, what I remember where I was when I first heard this and it hit me in the motherfucking mouth. It was Can't Feel My Face by the week. Mm-hmm. And then you couldn't feel your face after it hit you in the mouth. And I couldn't feel my face. No, I... I like literally like my jaw was open like I could not believe what I was listening to I was like this is a perfect pop song this is so hard my god this is like incredibly hard it is the hardest top five <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go for five and I'm just gonna like I don't know how to put them in order and I don't even know if they're my top five but they're just like the five that I'm gonna say subject to change first up Your Body by Christina Aguilera I fucking love Your Body by yes. Christina Aguilera so glad that's got a shout out <laughs> I just think that like it's the best Christina Aguilera song it is like just pure epic like it is just like she just is screaming on it it's he can provide the bombast match and i don't know why that song was not a smash it's quintessential max martin it's so good i'd say i would throw in there stronger by britney spears which i think is like max martin does abba in Mm. the best possible way Mm. And I just love that record. I mean, there's it's hard to pick a favorite of the Max Britney songs, but like, I think that might, it's either that or maybe one more time for me. And I think Stronger is just like kind of the apex of their collaboration in the early period. I will say Show Me Love by Robin, his first, I think that's like the sort of prototypical Max Martin song, like the Britney songs before the Britney songs. Like Mm. that was where he really like found his groove. And I think that that song still holds up incredibly. Like sometimes the song is just so great and quite literally found his groove. Found his groove. (laughs) 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 And another random one that like, again, like I like literally don't know if these are my favorites, but these are the ones that are just like 
here right now is Rockin by the Weekend which is on oh. Starboy and it's like kind Ooh. of like a it's like a house song and it's it's not even a single I don't think but it's I think my favorite song that they've done together like literally I feel like I could say 500 of these and they'd be equally true so I'm just like just just list his whole discography I was holding myself back from saying Miranda Cosgrove dancing crazy like <laughs> <laughs> you and Miranda god damn it <laughs> I'm also like so incredibly tempted to say like I did something bad or ready for it but I'm not going to I'll... I love ready for it and everyone's yeah, I do wrong too. about ready for I it agree. as well I agree I <laughs> agree in terms of his production I think ready for it is top tier for him it's so good I'll say style instead because I think style's pretty much Ooh. a perfect song and like maybe the best song on uh, 1989 and one of her best songs ever and is just like so thick and so sweaty and so amazing and so I guess I'll I'll go with those five <laughs> So sweaty. I literally feel like I could have said five entirely different songs and been like equally passionate about them though. So like yeah. my I had a long list, then I had a short list, then I had one honorary mention, and it pained me just to have one. So I know. I'm like I'm like <laughs> looking at all the other songs on this list and being like, but also this one, but also yes. that one. Yeah. Yes. I had to go off of like literal plays. Like I was like, I was like, I, I gotta bring in numbers to help me decide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Oh god, it was so fun, guys. My pleasure. If people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Well, I would say check out my podcast, Pop Pantheon. If you're into this show, I know you've probably heard ads for it, but it's true. I think it's really good. <laughs> it is. I love the concept. <laughs> Thanks. It's about pop stars. And I have a really in-depth conversation with a great guest every single time. I'm blown away by all mm. the people that have been on the shows. Everyone from the New Yorkers, Gia Tolentino to, you know, Rolling Stones, Bernie Spanos and people from like Yale professors and <laughs> it's been John Seabrook John Seabrook I mean New York Times Joe Coscarelli and Lindsay Zolatz I mean it's it's really like an all-star team 100% that have made the show amazing and we do like an in-depth deep dive on a pop star's career and then we rank them in like a fantasy football-ish kind of way although I don't totally know what fantasy football is but I, but I think <laughs> fantasy football is we do now the more I think about it the less I think it's like fantasy football <laughs> it's probably not like fantasy football at all <laughs> We're all way too queer to know, so it's fine. <laughs> but like nobody, I literally no one has quibbled with me who listens to the show, like of like the thousands of people that are listening to the show, like nobody knows. they're all queer as well. <laughs> of the people who have listened to the show. <laughs> like literally not one of them knows that, I, that that is not accurate. So like I just keep oh, saying man. it. But yeah, yeah, I think that it's really, it's like, it's both interesting and fun. And I think that people will enjoy it. So it's called Pop Pantheon. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. And then, of course, I'm on social media at DJ L O U I E X I V and Pop Pantheon Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. Sweet. Go do it. Go listen to him. Go follow Louis. He is so unbelievably knowledgeable. And he literally wrote the article on micro pop stars. So, what more could you want from an individual? Like, <laughs> truly, though. My impact. And if you want to follow me, you you can find me at AJ Marks Official on all my socials and stream my music as just AJ Marks on Spotify or wherever you listen to music. Yes, and if you want to follow me, you can find me at I Am Solo Music on all platforms. And I also have some music out. I'm going to suggest a different one this time. Look up Highs and Lows by Sola on your favorite music platform but i do have some new music coming and i am so ready for this new era let's go it's my maximalist era no, I'm kidding. <laughs> thank you so much once again and if you want to give us a rating and some love please do that on the platform that you're listening to this podcast on and thank you so much nick for the episode artwork and huge shout out to noah for the new theme music okay bye bye, bye guys. 